If only life were a straight path to our desired destination, wouldn't life be so much easier? Yeah, maybe. But those unexpected zigzags in our path teach us that life's tough struggles have greater purpose than we ever imagined. Stories and strategies are our focus for season four. Zigzag in One host, Melanie Brown, chats with courageous women who share their stories of encountering zigzags and how they fought to overcome them. Be assured, their stories will inspire and encourage you. But we know warm and fuzzy feelings aren't enough to equip you to fight those challenging zigzags in your path. So, this season, our guests are joining us for another episode to share strategies, mindsets, and habits that strengthened and empowered them during their toughest seasons. Join us in declaring, zigzags may interrupt our path, but they will not deter us. We will keep moving forward. Thanks for joining me for today's interview with Paralympian Gia Pergolini. A few Olympic facts before we jump into our interview. Did you know that since the first Olympic Games in 1896, the Summer Olympics have only been canceled three times, and all three times were a result of world wars? And not until the 2020 Olympics have the Games ever been postponed. And as you know, they were postponed due to the global pandemic. At the time the games were postponed, Gia was a 16-year-old high school student who had been training to compete in her favorite event, the 100-meter backstroke. When the Paralympics were finally rescheduled for the summer of 2021 in Tokyo, Gia was ready. This now 18-year-old woman is simply adorable. She is filled with joy. She is a fighter not only to navigate life with 30% vision, but also as a fierce competitor in the pool. Join me for my conversation with world record holder and gold medalist, Gia Pergolini. Gia. I am so excited to have you on the show. Uh, Thank you. I'm glad to be here. (laughs) This last month, even this last year, has been extremely busy for you. You just graduated high school. Congratulations. Thank you so much. It has been such a crazy year. This June, actually, I'm going to world championships for, um, for swimming in Portugal. Portugal. So I'm training for that right now. I'm really excited. And then coming August, I'll be moving to Miami to go to college at Florida International University. That is so exciting. I have vacation plans, but I don't (laughs) have any kind of plans like you do. That's so exciting. It's I'm very excited. So as far as the championship in Portugal, Mm -hmm. what do you do in order to train for that? Oh, gosh. I practice a lot. (laughs) That's kind of an understatement, but I practice Monday through Saturday and I have to swim doubles, which is swim two practices a day on Tuesdays and Thursdays. But that's now, that's not including my summer schedule. My summer schedule is way more hectic and way crazier than my school year round schedule. Um, This summer, I think I have three doubles, in a week and each practice is either two and a half hours or three hours long. That's crazy. That is a lot of time in the pool. It's a lot, yep. (laughs) Yes. Well, obviously you enjoy it if you're willing to spend that much time. Uh, I do enjoy it majority of the time. Sometimes I want to sleep, but (laughs) I enjoy it. I can understand that too. But you have to put in that hard work in order to become a Paralympian. Of course. A lot of work. <laughs> and so that didn't happen too long ago either. Nope. Happened this past August. Yes. And we're going to get to that. But I okay. want to make sure we start with your story mm-hmm. so that when people are listening, 
they understand what a big deal it is that at 18 years old, you can say you are an Olympian. Uh huh. In my <laughs> mind, that is incredible. Oh my gosh, thank you. It is just amazing. So let's go back to where you even started with swimming. How old were you when you started taking swimming lessons? I, I was three, I believe, when I started doing swimming lessons, but it wasn't until I was five or six I joined year-round swimming, and um, my mother actually put me in year-round swimming because I just loved being underwater, and I would always jump in the pool without my floaties on, so they were like, okay, we need to get this girl in lessons. (laughs) I was a little adventurous, especially I have two older brothers that would play with me in the pool and push me in the pool, and so (laughs) I I had to fend for myself in the water. (laughs) That's fantastic. So you knew from early on that this was something that you really enjoyed. Yes. So take us forward from there. You were doing swimming. Did you do any other sports? Yes, when I was younger, um, around third grade-ish, I feel like every kid goes through that stage where they just do a bunch of sports at once yes. and see what fits. But I did soccer, tennis, gymnastics, lacrosse, and Goodness. swimming. Wow. I, yep. <laughs> that is fantastic. Now, part of why you are a para-Olympian rather than Mm -hmm. an Olympian is because you have a disease that has impacted you such that you qualify for the Mm Paralympians. When did all of that come about? I have Stargardt's disease, which is a genetic eye disease that only lets me see peripherally. I can't really see details until I get really, really close. But I've always had it my whole life, but it wasn't until kindergarten and first grade where I actually had to do start doing some sort of work on paper or looking at the board where I noticed that I couldn't see as well as the other kids. And my mother took me to all these doctors and the teachers were telling her that there's something wrong, but they don't know what, and the doctors didn't know what, and it was, it wasn't until fourth grade actually. So from kindergarten to fourth grade, no one knew what was wrong with me. Some some people thought I was actually faking it, which is goodness crazy too. But in fourth grade, they looked in the back of my eye because that's where my disease is, and they found that I had Stargardt's disease. Mm-hmm. That is. A big thing for a very young person to take on and to live with. Mm -hmm. How how did that um, impact your life going forward once you had the diagnosis? I was so young that I didn't really comprehend the seriousness of it. Sure. Plus, I had it all my life, so it's not like I know some people that had 20-20 vision, perfect vision, and then lost it, and so they know what they missed out missed out on and so for me it was just normal I had to get stuff to help me in school like I got a video magnifier and all this stuff it was not until actually high school that I realized how serious it was because all the kids my age are learning how to drive and then they're getting their license and I can never drive or get my license so that kind of hit me the hardest but other than that completely normal I try not to let it stop me that is interesting in so many ways Mm -hmm. Uh, I am a special education teacher and I've never had a student that had any kind of vision issues Mm -hmm. like you have Mm -hmm. but I I know the struggle that those students have when they have a disability and how they feel different than their peers and their peers don't understand Mm -hmm. and I'm even thinking back before you were diagnosed You didn't know any differently because, as you said, that's the way it's always been. When we're very young, we don't have the words to describe it to somebody else because it's just the way that we always have been, Mm -hmm. and we don't know that it should be a different way. Mm -hmm. And if they're asking you questions, I would assume you can't say, well, I can see peripherally. Yeah. Uh, you can't, yeah. I mean, you don't, you don't have those words. It's really hard to explain to them yes. because I, I don't know what they see and they don't know what yes. I can see. So it's confusing both ways. <laughs> I can only imagine. Yeah. As far as school though, 
Uh, how did that impact your ability to do the, the schoolwork? I know you said you had some modifications yeah. and some accommodations. Mm -hmm. So I have, I've had great teachers now and in the past that helped me helped me with my schoolwork and trying to see the board. I can't really see the board, so they would they would either send me notes or after class I would go up to them and they would tell me what I missed on the board and that was the best help that I could have. But now in our day and age we use a lot of stuff on the computer. Yes. And so that is really good for the visual impairment community because there's a lot of it, accessibilities on the computer uh, for visual impairment so I can zoom in on all my paperwork and all this yes. stuff so if we're doing like testing quizzes on paper I usually I have a video magnifier where I could put it on um, the piece of paper and it will zoom in as far as I need and it can also change the different colors on the paper. I prefer, preferably love inverted colors, which changes black to white. And, Very and, interesting. Yeah. Yep. This is probably going to be a tough question for mm -hmm. you, but I think it's important for the listeners to understand how this impacted your peer relationships. Oh, yes. I love tough questions. So. <laughs> <laughs> well, good. I, can, I can certainly come up with a few more. When I was younger, I did get bullied a lot, um, mm. and I did lose a lot of friends. And not only was I angry about me losing friends, but I was also angry. It started mostly in fourth grade, so by the time I figured out what I had, I was angry at that, and that kind of affected my friendships. And I just thought I was alone for a lot of it, and... Mm -hmm. um, I was very, I was a very angry girl from fourth to sixth grade. I just, I just felt like no one understands and all this stuff and kids were making fun of me. And um, it was not until seventh grade I found, I actually started finding friends, but I was still fighting my inner demons and it was... It was it was a really tough road, and high school is really where I found true friends that I love to this day. Right now, it's my friendships, both or yeah, and in, in school, it's it's been a lot better. So yeah, because friends are important. Yeah, you would feel isolated mm -hmm. and alone, mm -hmm. uh, even though I have to wear contacts or glasses. Mm -hmm. I don't understand how you have to view the world. Mm -hmm. Is God a part of this at all? I did rely on God for a lot of it. I would pray to him um, almost every day and I would write. I would write in my diary a lot to him. It was basically, it was to myself and to him. Just help me, guide me to a better place in my life. And I always um, knew that he has a plan for me. If I can fight these battles, then I know I'll come out stronger in the end. So yes, um, I did go to a Catholic school for nine years. So uh, God was part of my life almost every day. It really helped. It really did help. I can see how that would be um, very important to have someone that you can speak to, mm -hmm. especially our God, mm -hmm. if you're having difficulty with peer relationships mm -hmm. or you're frustrated or school is hard because maybe the accommodations aren't just right yet, mm -hmm. all of those things. You are kind of on the other end of it at this point yeah. with graduating and going uh -huh. on to college. I'm assuming mm -hmm. you have a, a swim scholarship. Yes. <laughs> so let's talk about how swimming was uh, an important part of your life through all of this and how it helped you. Did, mm -hmm. it, did it help you? Oh, Definitely. <laughs> That's an understatement. So tell me about that. Me. Uh, well, when I was younger, um, when I was going through a lot with, like I said, friendships and my inner demons, I, swimming was and still is so therapeutic to me. I, it's just me and my thoughts, mm -hmm. like, looking at a black line for hours and hours and just thinking. And sometimes I would pray during that time and 
Um, if you want to let out a scream or two, <laughs> you, can, <laughs> you can underwater and, and no all, one will hear you. And the, and the water is trembling because yeah. Gia is below screaming. Yes. I, I still do it now. I would like scream underwater and it helps so much. And doing a hard practice and fulfilling that hard practice, yes. it's the best feeling in the world. Pushing um, yourself. Yeah, you just feel so accomplished. And I love the feeling that I get after practice. My face is all red. Um, my mom my mom drives me, so when she picks me up, she's like, your face is all red. You must have a great practice. I was like, it was terrible, but I'm glad I did it. <laughs> Sometimes the things that really push us, Frustrated during the moment, but then mm-hmm. afterwards, when you've accomplished it, yes. you're glad that you went through it. Mm-hmm. Yes. Swimming is definitely a very, very important part of your life. Definitely. Tell me how you were a swimmer and going to just daily practices to then becoming an Olympian. I, I want to hear the journey of oh, that because it doesn't just, okay, I think I'll just be an Olympian. And <laughs> Yeah, I think I'll go to Tokyo next week. <laughs> yeah, I don't think that that works that way. So um, tell me about that journey. Like I said, I started when I was six and then for about seven years, um, so when I was 13, my swim coach at the time came up to me and he was like, Gia, have you ever heard of Paralympics? And I was like, what? Back then, I was very naive to Paralympics. I didn't know a lot of information about it. Um, And he was like, it's um, where you can play a sport even if you're disabled. And I was like, what? I'm not disabled. What are you talking about? And So let me stop you right there. I love that you just said that, Mm -hmm. that you're not disabled. Mm -hmm. Why can you say that? At the time, I was and pretty successful for my age in swimming. And I didn't think my vision affected my swimming that much. And so when he was like, for disabled people, I just thought about people, I don't know, that wasn't me, like that had like missing limbs. Like I said, I didn't know a lot of information on Paralympics. So I just assumed I was a regular a, swimmer. A regular swimmer. And so when I went home and did my research and there's I saw people like me with visual problems going to Rio, I was like, oh, my gosh, this is so cool. And my mom was like, maybe you should try it out, go to a swim meet. I went to a para swimming and it was in Augusta, Georgia, and I'm so many amazing people, so many strong and powerful people that have these um, disabilities. I know a girl that was fully blind. Her name's McLean Hermes. She actually grew up in Georgia, and she's the first Paralympic swimmer I ever met. And um, she went to Rio, and I was like, oh, my gosh, this is so cool. I can't believe you can do this and not let your inflictions affect you. I did the swim meet, fell in love with it, and then – Next thing you knew, I was going to Canada. <laughs> and what was in Canada? Um, para nationals. And I was 13 at the time. And um, That's incredible. I, I, thank you so much. It was so cool. And then I got to meet more Paralympic swimmers. And I was starstruck by them. And so I was like, I want to pursue this. This is so cool. Next thing you know, a couple months later, I was in Berlin getting classified. You it was are a <laughs> world traveler. It was crazy. Um, the, the One of the head coaches in Canada came up to my mom and said, we want her to come to Berlin to get classified. My mom was like, what? <laughs> I'm like, she's just 13. <laughs> um, and she, this is her like first big pair of me. They were like, yeah, we want her to get classified. They basically in Berlin had to prove that I was visually impaired, and if so, what class I would be in. So the visual impairment class is from S11 to S13. I'm an S13. They classified me as an S13. So I have the most vision out of all the visual impairment classifications. When I was in Berlin, I got... I got a world record in my 200 back, but wow. <laughs> it lasted four minutes and 20 
20 seconds until the girl in the next heat beat it. So <laughs> so that was a world record? Yes. Goodness, uh, that is incredible. Thank you. And you were 13? Yes, it was crazy. Wow. Thank you. Berlin was super fun. Got to meet lifelong friends that I'm still friends with now. Um, yes, people who understand yeah. you. Yeah. Yeah, I, I love them to death. They're amazing people. But then I had to go to Colorado for world championships, world championship trials. I went there, and then I made my first world's team, um, which is in Mexico City, which was in Mexico City in December. So in one year, I went from Augusta, Georgia, to Canada, to Berlin, to Mexico City, um, all when I was 13. <laughs> that is just crazy. It but was crazy. How exciting and how many memories mm-hmm. and the thrill, as you said, of meeting people that were already champions mm-hmm. in this, this sport and this that you were so interested in, I guess, already starting to form goals for yourself. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so when I was going through all that, everybody was like, you can make it to Tokyo. And I was like, what? It was like my dream of being a professional athlete was like coming true. And I was like, okay, that's my goal. So for the next three years, I was just training, training, and then I made it to world championships in London. I... In Mexico City and in London, I got second place in the 100 back. The There was a very strong Italian girl um, Uh-oh. who was my biggest competitor in the backstroke. She, she's really fast, but I said to people, I was like, the only way you can beat an Italian is with another Italian. There and you go. I'm half Italian, so I guess I was like, okay. <laughs> Let me stop you there because I know from notes that I have Mm -hmm. that leading up to Tokyo, you had a little bit of a crisis moment where you're like, I don't know if I can do this or not. Oh, definitely. What brought that on? In 2020, obviously, the pandemic happened. Mm -hmm. And so there was just a lot going on. And then when I got back into swimming... um, I felt strong. I felt good. I love. I loved my coach. So it was. It was going great. And then it was my junior year. I started losing my hair. Oh goodness! And so I. I recently. Ha- I have had alopecia, and f- when I was fourteen, but it wasn't severe. I lost my eyebrows, and um, I want to say like twenty percent of my hair. But I got it all back. I was doing fine, and then. My junior year happened, and I was, this is actually my first time telling anyone this. Um, I feel very honored. Media, yeah. I kept losing hair, and I lost, I want to say, 85% of my hair. Oh, goodness. Um, I didn't lose my eyebrows. Um, That's a blessing, because me without eyebrows, it's not very pretty. (laughs) I understand. (laughs) But um, I lost 85% of my hair, and then I had to shave it all off. And for me, that was a huge deal, because my hair was basically the pinpoint of, like, my confidence. I I loved long hair. I didn't even want to cut an inch off of it when when it was long and healthy. I had to shave it all off, and at that point, I was struggling a lot with confidence, and I wasn't swimming as well as I wanted to, and I was just very depressed and angry that it wasn't growing back, and um, I wasn't successful in the water as I wanted to be, especially um, the nerves for Tokyo adding on to that. It was kind of weird. Um... When it when I shaved off all my hair about two weeks later, it started growing back, and so I was like, "Oh, thank Jesus!" Yes, yes, I would agree because I kind of like my curly hair too. Mm-hmm. So I understand if I were to lose all my hair, that would be a big deal, mm-hmm. and especially as a young person, yeah, um, that's really challenging mm-hmm. to already have something that you're struggling with and that you're fighting mm-hmm. to overcome. And then now 
Now you're having to face another issue. Yeah. Yes. So, and all during yeah. the pandemic, because all of us oh, struggled yeah. immensely mm-hmm. during the pandemic in different ways. But during that time, I think mom, if I'm not mistaken, sat you down and asked you if you were still interested in going and did you want to quit or did you want to keep going? What um, happened? For a little bit, um, my parents noticed that I was going through a rough time. So my dad came up with the idea to talk to my coach, Nick Graves, um, if I wanted to take a two-week break. And a two-week break is like a year in swimming. (laughs) If you take two weeks off, when you come back, it's going to be tough coming back. I was like, yeah, I want to take a two-week break just to rest my mind and be alone for a little bit. And so I talked to my coach and the stubborn man that he is <laughs> said, I don't think that would be a good idea. I talked to my parents and there was a practice, a very emotional practice where I was not happy. I was bawling my eyes out the whole time. And my mom sat me down and said, do you want to quit? And for a minute there I wanted to say yes but I was like in five years from now I know I'm gonna regret it Mm -hmm. so I would have looking back if I quit (laughs) I would have definitely regretted it so I'm glad I didn't quit but I got back onto my horse and about three weeks later I had the best practice in a very long time and ever since then each practice was getting better and better, and I felt so fast, so strong in the water, and my hair was growing back. I was still not really confident in my hair. I wore wigs for a while. Um, I still kind of do uh, when I want to look cute, but um, I was just very happy. I never felt stronger in the pool. When we struggle, and all of us struggle in different ways, Mm -hmm. there are always temptations Mm -hmm. to give up and quit. And that is a crucial moment. Mm -hmm. And as you said, for a moment there, yeah, I really wanted to throw in the towel and just be done with this, Mm -hmm. right? Yep. What was it that, besides the fact that you thought you might regret it, what was the part of your love for swimming that made you say, I'm going to keep going? Oh, my goodness. At that point, I wasn't swimming just for myself. I was swimming for my teammates, for my coach, and for my family. And so their love and support in and out of the water was what pushed me. Also, um, in the pandemic, when I took three months out of the water, by the end of it, I missed swimming so much. So I knew that one day I'm I'm going to miss it so much and want to get back in, so I shouldn't quit now. I, I love hearing that, especially mm-hmm. from, from a young person, because so often it's just easier to just give up when mm-hmm. you're young because you don't have all those life experiences to draw mm-hmm. from. But now this moment that you made that decision that I'm not going to give up because I want to continue, I don't want to regret this. Mm-hmm. That's something years from now, 20 years from now, 40 years from now, when you are going through some other kind of struggle, you're going to look back on that and you're going to say, I didn't quit then, Mm -hmm. not going to quit now. And so that becomes your experience later on. So you are very blessed in having an experience like that early on. Mm -hmm. And wow, it paid off. Yeah, It paid off for you to stay in there. (laughs) Definitely did. (laughs) Fast forward to Tokyo. Let's talk about the Paralympic Games. Yep. That summer, I was training, so I didn't have a summer. Um, I was training so much, didn't miss one day of practice. I went to Tokyo, the trials to make it to Tokyo, and um, I got a world record in my 100 back. Wow. And um, you're just a beast. <laughs> Thank you. You're just impressive. Thank you. And every time I swam the 100 back, there's always a prelims and then there, there's a finals. I would get faster and faster each race. And so when it came Tokyo time, I was I was ready. I was pumped. I saw the pool. I swam the 100 fly um, the day before the 100 back. And I loved the pool. It was an amazing pool. I was having so much fun. I was confident. 
Um, I had a great race. It was a great start to the meet. And then the next day was the 100 back. And I tell everyone, I was definitely 20 times more nervous a month prior to the games than I was behind the block uh, for my 100 back. My 100 back is my main event. If Yes, no I, I noticed with all of the uh, <laughs> awards and, and uh, records and such, mm-hmm. the majority of them are the backstroke. backstroke. I think so. that's, that's just great. Yeah, so backstroke's my baby. The race I was mostly training for and had my... Um, hopes of gold for and so when the 100 back came along I was pumped I was ready I was confident in my training and what my coaches did and it was so much fun I got in the water swam my little heart out and um I got a world record and the gold medal and I finally beat the Italian girl (laughs) I hope she doesn't listen to this I don't think she would listen to this but hi if you are you know who you are (laughs) it's okay if you beat her that just means that she's gonna train all the harder for the next one Mm, and so you need to be training as well definitely definitely so what did it feel like to stand up there and to see all all the people cheering and to accept the gold medal around your neck oh my gosh it was surreal hearing the national anthem and looking up at the flag it was I've been dreaming about that moment for four years three to four years and just seeing it play out and come true it was just amazing I wish I wish my whole family was there due to the COVID. due to COVID yeah. there was hardly an audience it was a really special moment but the funny thing is I, a lot of athletes who got a medal would tell you it lasts about five minutes and then you're ready to go to the next next challenge it was surreal in those three minutes three to five minutes I'm very grateful for it to this day, but now I'm focusing on the next challenge. That's because you're a competitor. Yes, yes. I, I love hearing that you already have the next goal in mind uh-huh. and that you're already working towards mm-hmm. it. That is fantastic. And especially at such a young age, and I know I keep bringing that up, mm-hmm. but you have gone through a lot oh. as an 18-year-old. <laughs> yes. And you are not letting any of those things defeat you Mm-hmm. or discourage you, yeah, or stop you. Mm-hmm. That is amazing for somebody mm-hmm. of any age, but especially a young person, because it's so easy to get so focused on peers and social media and boys totally. and all of the things. <laughs> and those none of those are bad. From what I can tell, the, those things, while they're important to you, you have your sights pun intended, on on bigger and better things Mm -hmm. that will carry you, no telling where they will carry you Mm -hmm. in the future. Because I'm sure that you have met some incredible people just because you're a Paralympian. Totally. Like me. (laughs) (laughs) Absolutely. (laughs) Well, it's almost time for us to end, sadly. I did want to ask, do you have that one thing, that one takeaway that somebody that's listening, if they're going through a tough time Mm -hmm. and they think, I just want to quit, what would you tell them about continuing to pursue your goals and to not give up? Mm -hmm. From my experience, the best advice that I can give is there's always something that God is planning for you after you are done going through this tough time. I know when I was in a place where I thought there was no hope and all this stuff, looking back, I realized there was a bigger plan for me. And if you quit now, you will regret it. Uh, that's that's my biggest takeaway. Um, you're a strong person. And no matter what life throws at you, there, there will be um, something at the end that will just bring you a lot of joy. It's the saying is true at at the end of every storm. There's a rainbow. I, I yeah, I, it, there <laughs> there most definitely is. Yeah. I love how you have put that, mm-hmm. and that is so important for all of us to remember because 
we're going to hit those zigzags. We're mm-hmm. going to hit those struggles throughout our lives. Our path is not one little straight line yeah. to the end. It's just not. It's going to zigzag all over the place. <laughs> totally. And every time it zigzags, we have to just say, we are just going to keep moving forward. Mm-hmm. Definitely. Gia, it has been such a joy Thank to you spend time so with you. Much. Very happy to be here. So excited. I was so excited for this. <laughs> well, I want us to keep in touch as you go through college, Definitely. especially so that I can follow you as you continue to pursue your dreams. Definitely. That is Thank exciting so for me to uh, be on the sidelines cheering you on. Thank you. <laughs> so as we finish, we always end with our tagline, and that is, when life zigs and zags, keep moving forward. Well said. (laughs) Beautiful. Beautiful.